the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Whispered Verdict. She sat at the big, shiny table, nervous, fighting a closed-in feeling that made it hard for her to breathe, sensing always the hundreds of eyes boring into the back of her head, the low, suspicious whispering from the townsfolk in the spectators' gallery. And she knew that this time she couldn't shrug it off, that the chips were down, and she, Edith Glenby, was on trial for her life. The prosecution has established that... Not only did Edith Glenby have a motive for murdering her husband, but also an opportunity. Carl Glenby was killed with a knife, probably the bone-handled knife missing from the Glenby carving set. <coughs> we are unable to produce that knife for the excellent reason that the murderer realized its importance and took especial pains to get rid of it. But the fact remains that Carl Glenby was killed with a knife. And you have all heard testimony stating Edith Glenby threatened to kill him in exactly that way. No, I didn't. That's a lie. Mrs. Glenby, Mrs. Glenby, this sort of thing won't help you. Well, I don't care. You can't let him say those things. I didn't threaten him. I didn't. When the defendant has regained control of herself, we will proceed with the summation. But it isn't easy to control yourself, Edith with the scales of justice teetering back and forth and your own life in the balance. You try and settle down, telling yourself your turn will come when Charlie Jackson, your lawyer, has his say. The prosecution has established that Mrs. Glenby quarreled with her husband. Yes, this woman you see before you, stunned with grief, miserable at this cruel and unwarranted accusation, is on trial for the murder of her husband simply because she quarreled with him. <coughs> Let the one who can honestly say there has never been a marital squabble in his family cast the first stone or the first ballot for conviction. You were smart to retain Charlie Jackson, weren't you, Edith? His young, honest face, his candid eyes, the sincere delivery that's so important now as he sums up to the jury. And you were shrewd with Charlie Edith about that last quarrel. He knows just what he ought to know, nothing more. The jury is retired now, and you begin to feel confident, manage to appear casual as you glance around at the spectators the people Carl was so proud to introduce you to just a year ago when he brought you to the big white house on Manfred Street as his bride. There's Andy, the gardener, sitting next to the cook, a plump, middle-aged Irish woman named Kate. That 
think Mr. Jackson's a fine lawyer, Andy. He'll get her off. You wait and see. Oh, I do hope so, Kate. The poor woman. Look at her there, so pale and pitiful she is. And on the other side of the courtroom, John Felden, the executor of Carl Glenby's estate, muttering something to his wife, Agnes. I wish I knew what to make of that woman, Agnes. It's pretty simple to me. She married Carl for his money. When she found he wouldn't hold still for it, she put a knife in him. Well, I suppose that's for the jury to decide. Fortunately, though, I can make my own decision about the money. It seems an age before the door to the jury room opens, and the 12 most important people in the world take their places in the box. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have, Your Honor. Will you hand it to the clerk, please? <clears throat> we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Oh, no. In the judge's chambers, Mrs. Glenby, you, uh, you collapsed when the verdict was announced. Oh, Charlie. They acquitted me. You did it. I, I'm safe. I never had a moment's doubt you would be. It's really over. They, they can't try me again. No? No matter what they find out? Is there something to find out? No, no. I, I only meant if... If somebody should trump up a piece of evidence... Like the murder knife, I suppose? Well, maybe. You know, Mrs. Glenby, there's another court, higher than the one that just cleared you. It's public opinion. Sometimes its verdict carries heavier penalties than the one you've just escaped. Well, I don't care what people think of me in this town. You don't intend to stay here? After the way these yokels have treated me, the sooner I can sell the house and clear out, the better I'll like it. Under the circumstances, I think you're wise. What does that mean, Charlie? Whatever you want it to mean, Mrs. Glenby. Good day. Well, Edith, you can tell from the set look on Charlie Jackson's face that now for the first time since you came to him, he suspects the truth, that the woman he defended so ably was guilty. But it doesn't bother you now, does it? The things that really count are the real reasons you murdered your husband. The big white house, the fortune and guilt edge securities, the insurance policies. And you know now that everything will depend on John Felden, Carl's executor. You're a widow now, Edith. A wealthy widow. The next evening when you arrive at John Felden's home, you're hoping he will understand that fact. Hello, Agnes. Good evening. Is your husband in? I'd like to talk to him about Carl's estate. Sit down, won't you? Thanks. John, Mrs. Glenby is here. Be there in a minute. Oh, thank you, Agnes. I, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to speak to you after the trial. Don't apologize. I'm rather glad you didn't. Why, why Agnes, what do you I'm mean? I'm sorry. You may as well know how I feel. What do you mean? Well, Edith, I've lost a great deal of faith in the courts. Hey. I can't possibly think I was guilty. Not after the it jury... It isn't only what I think. It's what everybody thinks. It's all over town, Edith. If your innocence had been clearly established, so many people wouldn't well, feel that... good evening. I, I only dropped in for a moment, John, to see how soon you could arrange for the sale of the house. You're very prompt. Apparently, you've lost confidence in the jury system, too. Perhaps. However, as executor of Carl's estate, I'm forced to treat your late husband's affairs as a matter of sound business, Mrs. Glenby. I'm aware of that. Good. Then you're also aware that all of his property, all of it, including the house, has been left in trust for you. A trust uh, not likely to be dissipated. That's for me to decide. As his beneficiary... I haven't I... finished. As you know, Carl and I had been friends for a great many years. At the time of your marriage, he drew up a trust agreement which leaves the administration of his estate entirely up to my discretion. I intend to carry out his instructions to the letter. But where does that leave me? I, I've simply got to have There will be I a stated amount coming to you on the first of every month. Ample for your needs here. You still think I killed him? I didn't say that. The, the man who killed my husband is still at large somewhere, John. 
He'll be caught sooner or later, and you'll be very sorry for what you've said. When that happens, you'll find me very ready to apologize, Mrs. Glenby. To put it bluntly, then, I don't get the money until you Until have... I'm completely convinced of your innocence. Exactly. Very well, John. I guess the next move is up to me. With the prologue of Whispered Verdict, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. You regular Whistler fans have all heard me speak of the more thorough, more conscientious service cars get at dealer-owned Signal service stations. But the really important thing is what customers say about it. That's why we're so happy to receive letters such as this one I have with me tonight. It's from J. Edward Keating of Los Angeles who writes... The first tank full of signal gasoline I ever tried was at the station owned by Jerry Holtzfaster. Well, it took just that one experience to convince me that signal gasoline not only deserves its growing popularity, but also that signal dealers are quite different from the usual station managers. Mr. Holtzfaster showed a genuine eagerness to please by giving many little unasked for services that make such a big difference in driving pleasure. And I found I could place complete confidence in his recommendations. Since then, although a change in location has placed me out of Jerry Holtzfaster's neighborhood, I gladly drive out of my way to get his kind of service, which means I'm a steady signal customer and I like it. Well, Mr. Keating, if Jerry was listening to your very kind words in the whistler just now, I'm sure he was as happy and appreciative as we at Signal Oil Company were when we received your letter. It's such commendations from customers that we're constantly receiving which make signal dealers strive to do an ever better job of making today's cars run better and last longer. Now, back to the whistler. It's taken a strange turn, hasn't it? You were so sure that the one thing that stood between you and the thing you killed for was the verdict of the jury. But there's another verdict. A whispered one voiced in the stores, in the churches, wherever the townspeople congregate. And you know until you're acquitted in the mind of your husband's executor, John Felton, your legacy is out of reach. So it's up to you, Edith. The next move is yours. It's several days later when you finally arrive at the answer. You call Kate in one evening before dinner as you sit at your dressing table. Kate? Yes, Mrs. Glenby. Have you seen anything of that gold necklace of mine, the one with the little round locket? Your necklace? Why, no, Mrs. Glenby. It's gone? Yes. Oh, I'm sure it's been mislaid. But there hasn't been anyone in the house except me and Andy, Mrs. Glenby. Not since... Since... Mr. Glenby was killed, or perhaps not. But there was someone here that night. I didn't know anything was missing since the trouble. That is, except Mr. Glenby's wallet. If that... that man broke into the house to rob, he just might have taken along a piece of jewelry as well as the wallet. Of course, it is possible. Too bad you couldn't give the police a better description of the robber you said killed your husband. Well, if the light had been on, I might have. Oh, goodness. I hope I didn't brush it off into a wastebasket or something. I think I'd have seen it if you had. Unless it was mixed in with some papers or something. Tell me, Kate, do you always burn the rubbish out in the incinerator? No. Andy usually does that, but I can... Oh, Kate, if you don't mind, would you rummage around in the ashes out there sometime? You know, just in case. It started, isn't it, Edith? Your move to divert their suspicion. Yes. You know the missing necklace won't be in with that burned rubbish. But Kate might run across something else. Something that will turn the pointing fingers in another direction. Reverse the whispered verdict which stands against you. You wait patiently until later that afternoon. And then... Mrs. 
Glenby. Mrs. Glenby. Well, what is it, Kate? Mrs. Glenby, I, I looked out into the, in the incinerator for your necklace. You found it? No, this? I didn't. But I did find this. What? Oh, little bits of gold and leather. Yes. Like they put on the corners of gentlemen's wallets sometimes. Oh, I don't understand, Kate. How could you find them out there unless... I know exactly what you're thinking, ma'am. Mr. Glemby's wallet was the same kind of a gold binding. But if it was in our incinerator and... And if Andy usually does the burning, I... I know, ma'am. I could scarcely believe it myself. I've known Andy for seven years. He wouldn't steal anything. Why... Why, I'd sooner believe he stuck that carving knife into poor Mr. Glenby's back. Oh, it's simply unthinkable. Kate, we mustn't say anything about it. I know how unreasonable people can be. How unfair. I'd hate myself if they started to suspect Andy. You're trembling with excitement now because your plan is working. You said just enough to Kate, showed the right amount of surprise, then left her alone with her thoughts. You've something else to attend to now, Edith. The carving knife buried in the garden, the knife you used to kill your husband. You slip outside to make certain that it's exactly where you left it, so that it'll be ready when you decide the time is right to plant it in Andy's room. You move down the gravel path toward the rose hedge. And then you stop and stare in disbelief. Here at the very spot where you buried the knife, someone has been digging. Oh, Mrs. Glenn. Oh, 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 Andy. Oh, you gave me such a start. I guess you surprised me too, ma'am. Not used to seeing you here out in the garden. Oh, Mr. Glenby thought so much of these tea roses. Goodness, who's been digging around them so? Oh, Goldie, I expect. That collie sometimes forgets where he's buried some old chunk of bone, so he goes hunting for it. Oh, but Andy, he shouldn't be rooting up Carl's favorite roses. I I simply won't permit it. Well, I do the best I can to keep him out of them, well, ma'am. You'll have to do more than that, I'm afraid. Why, it's a sacrilege. Andy, I'm afraid you'll just have to get rid of Goldie. Oh, now, ma'am. Mr. Glenby was fond of the dog. Well, and I don't I... care, Andy. Well, I don't expect you to put the animal out of the way yourself. You can take him to the veterinary. Have it done. Oh, I wish you wouldn't ask that, ma'am. I, I'm almighty fond of that collie myself, and I know Mr. Glenby wouldn't like You'll it. You'll do as I say, Andy. My mind's made up. Here. Here's some money for the vet. Oh, but, ma'am, I... A fifty? Ma'am, it won't cost fifty dollars, even well, if... Well, you can have it changed at the bank. It's all I have with me now. And... I want this done right away, Andy. This instant. I won't have any more digging up of these roses. Understand? You leave Andy staring after you in hurt bewilderment. And as you walk down the path, you're thinking that the carving knife couldn't be in a better place. It was only the dog that did the digging, and he didn't dig deep. The knife will be there when you want it, won't it, Edith? Right now, there's something else to attend to. So you hurry across town to the Feldens' home. Oh, Mrs. Glenn. Agnes, I must talk to you. I need advice. I believe my husband has paid a salary to give you... Look at this, Agnes. Gold and bits of burnt leather... I don't understand. Look at the other corners off Carl's wallet. The one he had when that robber killed him. Kate just found it in the ashes of our incinerator. Your incinerator? Who, who could have burned it there? Well, Kate blurted out that it must have been Andy. Of course, he's the only one on the place besides Kate and me, but I simply cannot the believe that... The burnt wallet. Yes. If it had been Andy... That would account for nobody seeing any strangers near your house that night. Well, it would, yes. But Andy said he wasn't around either. Well, we haven't any proof except these burned bits of leather. Still, oh, I... I'm so distressed about it, Agnes. I wish I knew what to do. Kate thinks we ought to notify the police. I know she does. But 
Until there's something more definite, I'd hate to mix poor Andy up in this. He's been so faithful and all. I know. Look, why don't you let me call John at the bank? He won't be there now, but I can reach him later. Oh, would you ask John? I'm sure he'll know what to do. After all, it's to all our interests. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. Oh, Edith, I don't quite know how to say it, but perhaps John and I have been rather hasty in our judgment, but... But you see... Of course, dear, it doesn't matter. All that's important now is that we straighten this thing out. I'll be waiting for your call, Agnes, at home. Yes, Edith, you'll be waiting for Agnes to call, to tell you John has decided that the only thing to do is notify the police. You're certain he'll do that. John Felden is such a cautious, practical man. And when he does give the word, you'll know that it's safe to hide the knife somewhere in Andy's room, that Andy won't have time to stumble across it himself before the police arrive. It's late when you return home, but Kate tells you no one has telephoned. She also tells you something else. Faith, and I'm glad you're home, ma'am. Seems like things are always coming up when folks are away. Well, what is it, Kate? The plumbers, ma'am. They were here while you was over to the Feldens. Plumbers? What for, Kate? I didn't send... For... Andy sent for them. Pipes in the garage are all clogged up. Well, he didn't say anything to me about it. I suspect he had something else on his mind. Anyway, I didn't want to let them go ahead digging up the garden where the pipes go until they'd given you some idea what it would cost. Well, I should say not. I don't want people all over the place digging everything up. Well, that's just what I just said to him, ma'am, but you see that... Oh, we'll talk about it later, Kate. Yes, ma'am. I think that's Mrs. Felden calling. Hello? Edith, I just talked to John. He's working late at the bank tonight. Oh, what does he think we should do? Well, he insists on calling the police right away. He wants them to make a search of Andy's things. Oh, Agnes, I hate to let them do that. They mustn't. I'd feel simply terrible but if... But you he... won't have a single thing to do with it, Edith. John is sending the officers entirely on his own responsibility because... Yes? Well, Andy came into the bank this afternoon with a very hangdog expression and asked to have a $50 bill changed. A $50 bill? That's a lot of money for Andy to be carrying. And John wondered if Carl had any 50s in his wallet that, that night, Agnes. Would you remember? No, I wouldn't. Carried large amounts of cash from time to time, but oh, I... don't you fret about it. The police will find out. Oh, Agnes... Can't we at least wait until Andy comes home? It doesn't seem right going into his room. Well, if they don't find anything, he may not even have to know, Edith. Now, you leave it all up to John. He knows the district attorney personally. Oh, I feel terrible about it, Agnes. I, I don't want to be here if they arrest him. If you don't mind, I, I'd like to come over and be with you. Oh, come right ahead, Edith. I understand. But I'll leave right away. Yes, Edith, you'll leave right away. That is after you take care of one more detail. The trap is all set for Andy, but now it must be baited. That part will be simple, won't it, Edith? All you have to do is get the knife from the spot where you buried it near the rose hedge and hide it in Andy's room. John Felden and the district attorney will do the rest. They'll fit the parts together. You know there won't be any doubt of Andy's guilt as you think of the district attorney's words in the courtroom. The murder realized the importance of the knife, and because of that fact, took his special pains to get rid of it. That's all they need, isn't it, Edith? All they need to find the murderer is to find the person with a knife. Going out again, ma'am? Well, I have to run back to the Feltons for a few minutes, Kate. Oh? Now, let's see. Did I drive the car into the garage? I think you did, ma'am. Oh, yes. Well, I'll have to get it. Oh, oh, and uh, when Andy gets back, Kate, would you ask him to wait here in the house for me? I want to talk to him. Well, begging your pardon, ma'am, I don't think Andy will be back. You don't? No. Well, but why, Kate? Why don't you think so? Something he said when he went away with Goldie, ma'am, the collie dog. Something about if there wasn't a place here for the master's dog, there wasn't room for his gardener either. Oh. He said nobody should be too surprised if he didn't show up around here again. I'd have told you before... Only there were other things on my mind, and... Kate, I wish Andy hadn't done that. People are so likely to misunderstand his running away. Oh, well, we'll know more about it before long. Good night, Kate. The whistle.
Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a word to you drivers who want to be sure you're getting the tops in quality when you buy gasoline. Just consider the facts. The only way any gasoline can put superior performance into your car is by helping your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you get better mileage. So better quality in gasoline not only means better performance, but also better mileage. That's why we're so proud of Signal's good mileage. And it's why we say, to be sure of tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. Now, back to the whistler. So there were two verdicts in the case of the state versus Edith Glenby, weren't there, Edith? The juries and the public. And you're sure now that in a matter of hours, the suspicious whisperings around town will become apologies, with John Felden the most humble of all. Yes, Edith. Once the all-important knife is found in Andy's room over the garage, it'll be all over. You leave Kate in the house, start back for the garage by way of the rose hedge, of course. And you're wondering, Edith, if your timing is right, hoping John Felden is on his way. You know, D.A., if the gardener killed Glenby, we're going to look like a couple of fools. Well, it's still only a theory, Felden. Uh, we might have to do a lot of apologizing to Mrs. Glenby. Yes, I admit I could have been more careful with that gardener. But if it develops that an apology is in order, i certainly be the first one to do it, and in public. Well, here we are. I can't help feeling I've been unjust to her. Somehow I don't Felden, think... is that you? Yes? Mr. Felden, I hoped you'd get here. Come quickly. Uh, what's the matter? I called you right away. No one answered. Then I called a doctor. What are you talking about, Katie? Here. Here we are, only... Watch where you step. Oh, I can't see. Well, I, I have a match. It's Edith. Yes, Mrs. Glenby. I told her the plumber's dug a trench out here. I I guess she didn't pay much attention. Why, she's hurt badly. She, she's dead. But what was she doing out here in the garden? Oh, look. There at the V of her dress. Yes, it is a missing knife. The knife from our carving set. She must have been holding it when she fell. A missing carving knife. Then she had it all along. No, wait. Don't touch it. I'd uh, better get in touch with my office. And offhand, Felden, I'd say we won't have to apologize to anybody. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Wednesday at the same time, brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story was Miss Irene Tedrow. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, with story by Stuart Sterling, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>